and I'm Charlie Winham, and welcome to Lost Louisiana Places of Worship. The places of worship dotting Louisiana are as diverse as its people. In the next hour, we will explore some of the sanctuaries of the South. I'm at Grace Episcopal Church and Cemetery in St. Francisville. In a little while, we'll find out how the folks in this area saw the Civil War stop for one day on the grounds of Grace. We will also head to a synagogue in New Orleans that not only carries on Jewish traditions, but also has a vibrant foothold in Louisiana customs as well. We'll even find a former Shreveport shopping mall that underwent the unlikeliest of conversions and is now a Baptist church. And in contrast, we'll step inside one of the smallest chapels in the world that was built by a grateful Italian farmer. We begin in Thibodeau, where there is a large church along Canal Street that has been a significant part of the landscape for nearly 90 years. It is St. Joseph's Co-Cathedral, and it is one of the more impressive churches you will find in rural America. St. Joseph's Co-Cathedral in Thibodeau was built in 1923, but has its roots in the Louisiana Bayou for almost 200 years. The congregation began in a small wooden mission church located about a mile away from here in 1819. Two structures and one fire later, Monsignor Alexander Barbier began the construction of the current day St. Joseph's in 1920 and the cathedral is easily regarded as one of the most impressive churches in the South. How does a church this beautiful, this large and ornate, end up in, in Lafouche Parish in, in Thibodeau? Well, I guess it was the determination of the of Monsignor Barbier then, who was passed from uh, 1911 to 1933. Okay. And he had this idea, he said that he wanted to build a church that one day would be a cathedral. He succeeded. He succeeded. It reminds me so much of uh, the churches in Rome and in France, you know. I visited there both places. And uh, you can see uh, the architecture brought out this, more or less very much like it. You know. St. Joseph's is Renaissance Romanesque, and it took three years to build this massive sanctuary. The rose window in the rear of the church is modeled after the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris. The marble pillars making up the ornate main altar traveled on a barge from Europe along Bayou Lafouche and weigh 5,000 pounds each. This rural church cost roughly half a million dollars to build back in the 20s and would cost close to $17 million today. I feel wonderful when I walk in here and I thank God every day for letting me come. <laughs> you know, it's just, it just, it just makes you feel so comfortable. You know, it's just a, a feeling that comes over you that makes you enjoy being part of this church and this parish. This church is just the place you know, it's just, I mean, you sit back, stand back here and you look at that mirror, that window up in the choir loft. And I mean, it just, it just catches your eye. And you look at all the stained glass windows and they all depict something special. And it's just, you don't see this in modern churches today. You know, it's just, just like a church, but it's nothing ornate as this church. This church is very, very special, I think, to everybody in Thibodeau. Margaret is a lifelong member, and so is Gibbons Robichaux. One of his favorite parts of the church is the elaborate ceiling, which includes a painting of St. Joseph and intricate gold leafing. In 1954, they brought a gentleman in for 13 months on his back on a scaffold, and he gold leafed. When you see the pictures later, the gold leaf is there. He, he took that like Michelangelo, a little, little jar of gold paint, one, one little brush at a time, what you see up there. If you also look up in the church, you could easily consider Gibbons a fixture inside the cathedral as well. Mm -hmm. 
Gibbons, how long have you been the organist in this church? Well, I, I've been the organist since 1964. I was in the choir when I came out of the service in 55. So I've been associated with the church upstairs for that long. The same year the Beatles debuted on the Ed Sullivan Show, Gibbons Robichaux began playing at St. Joseph's. That adds up to roughly 500 weddings and about 1,500 funerals inside these cathedral halls. Music background increases your devotion in prayer, you know. Now some people say, no, I'd rather be quiet, pray quietly. But uh, people take a part in the liturgy. You know, it didn't used to be like that. The mass used to be the priest was up at the altar with his back to you, and he was the whole thing. You know, people never said anything. It was in Latin, you know. What are some of your favorite songs to play on the organ? Oh, of course, we go back to Holy God, we praise thy name. Oh, Lord, I am not worthy, you know. Uh, the Ave Maria, everybody asks for that all the time. Schubert's Ave Maria. Gibbons has great musical range. So does the church organ. It used to be in a silent movie house until its usefulness was eliminated by talking movies. A family in the congregation discovered it. And in 1932, there was a new role for this Wix organ made in Illinois. It headed south and was born again. So this family were able to locate a $2,000 organ, the one that's up there now, in Illinois, and headed down here $2,000. And they've added, they've added some pipes to it since that time, but it's a, it's a beautiful organ. And uh, imagine, now it would cost $160,000 to replace it. Times change, huh? One item in the right transept of the cathedral remains eerily timeless. Inside a glass enclosure is a statue of St. Valery, a native of Rome who was beheaded during the Christian persecutions in the latter part of the second century. In about 1860, Father Menard, who was a pastor here for 50 years, went to Europe about 1860 for on a trip, and he wanted to bring something back to the people as a memory of his trip for the people of St. Joseph. And he, he, found, he went to a cardinal over there who had a relic of a bone of St. Valerie, who was a martyr. And inside the right arm of the statue contains the arm bone fragment of St. Valerie. When she arrived in Thibodeau in April of 1868, all businesses were closed and 4,000 people gathered to welcome St. Valerie to the rural church. Father Menard brought this relic to Louisiana in order to impress the spirit of piety and religion to his parishioners. Well, St. Valerie is our patron saint. And from June 1st to November 30th, we pray to St. Valerie to protect, protect lives and property here in this area. And um, she's done a wonderful job. She has protected us. A fire in 1916 would destroy the previous St. Joseph's Church, but volunteer firefighters rescued St. Valerie and the Blessed Sacrament. Every April 28th, the Feast of St. Valerie is celebrated and the firemen saved her. So in April, we have a special mass for St. Valerie. And then the firemen come in and take her, and we go around the block and recite the rosary and take her around the block. They d used to do that 100 years ago, and we're still doing it. Tradition, devotion, and resiliency are the cornerstones to the parish of St. Joseph's Co-Cathedral. The foundation laid down nearly 200 years ago remains an everlasting reminder in Thibodeau today and for generations to come.
Back in 1920, 30 bricklayers used 400,000 bricks to construct St. Joseph's. The cathedral is open to tourists all year round, and it is also very popular for weddings, and folks from all around Louisiana have decided to get married inside beautiful St. Joseph's. Next, we make our way over to Iberville Parish, which is home to thousands of Italian immigrants. In the sleepy corner of Bayou Gula, many call their community Little Italy, but it's not the only thing little in Bayou Gula. As churches go, this one in Bayou Gula is one of the smallest in the world. Just a few hundred steps from the Mississippi River and just a few feet off LA Highway 405 rests the Madonna Chapel. And if you want to get inside any time, just use the key. It's in the box to the right of the door. The box marked key. Thank you. Anybody comes, they know it. They can go get the key, open it up, go in and say their prayers, light a candle, do anything they want, you see. Mitzi Rapolo and husband A.J. know every inch of this 9 by 9 church. Married over 50 years ago, they have been the caretakers of the chapel since 1989. Well, to tell you the truth, she asked me, and she went and she had a little small operation done. And when she came back from that operation, when I went in the room to see her, she told me, I want to take care of that little church. I said, okay, we'll take care of it. In 1902, an Italian farmer and his family lived on this land. It is said that when the eldest son of Anthony Gulo became seriously ill, the father pledged a chapel to the Madonna if the boy recovered. He did recover, and the father kept his promise. And he collected donations from the people that were farmers around here because he wasn't a well-off person. No more than about six people can fit inside the Madonna Chapel at one time. The 21 statues and two rows of candles fill much of the room. A table on the left has a guest book. Do you get a lot of visitors? Yes, many visitors. I had a girl from Russia, she was an uh, exchange student that came and wrote me a beautiful note when she got back. So you never know who's going to stop by. It's harder for A.J. to get around these days, but to keep up with the upkeep, A.J. has help. Wouldn't have these fellas here that helped me. I couldn't do it because I, I got crippled now. I can't only walk, but uh, I got some good help. I got four, pe four boys is very, very dependable. Those four boys are Jack, Calvin, Leo, and Pecan, a group of retired gentlemen from nearby Plaquemine. These four youngsters range in ages 75 to 81. First thing we'll do to really make the yard look good, we'll edge, weed eat, and trim, and then cut the grass. And then if the fence needs washing, we'll wash it with Clorox, soap sud, and all, make it look good, and then we'll wash the bell off, and then we'll paint it. Nobody has a special job, only we all get together and help each other out. There is another building on the chapel grounds. It's the storage shed, and it's bigger than the church. The shed holds 250 chairs, and they use all of them once a year for the Feast of the Assumption Mass, held every August 15th. Yeah, I'm going to bring one over here, Cap. Who's going to clean all these chairs, Jack? You? And these men have a great deal of devotion for A.J. We'll come over here, um, my wife and I and Jack and them, we'll come over here whenever the grass needs to be cut and uh, the trace needs to be cleaned with Clorox, different things and all, the fence and everything. Whatever it takes, we come down here and do it for Mr. A.J. We like it. We like it. It's a joy. It's a pleasure. It's one of our pleasures in life. We all get together. We're good friends. Been friends all our life. And we just, we just come down and work. We look forward to this. In fact, I wish we had a couple down to you. The annual August Mass literally stops traffic in Bayou Gula. The descendants of the Gulo family now live in Rockford, Illinois, but they frequently attend this yearly service. The family also rebuilt the steeple after Hurricane Gustav in 2008. And every year at 9 a.m. on August 15th, a church bell fills this peaceful Bayou countryside. 
sometime when they rang it at nine o'clock, you know, a long time ago, most probably the people were on this land have a bunch of cattle back here. And when they would ring that bell, the, the, the cattle would come up here. Most probably they figured they had some food for them and all. So they would ring the bell so they'll come up here and they'd do some hooping and hollering. You ought to hear them. I believe God is here all the time. Uh, when we come down here, we, when we open that door there, it's, it's reverence down here. We take our hats off, we don't go inside that building. Even though we're working, we take our hats off in reverence. You know, we do just like Jesus do, honor and respect the Virgin Mary. It's very important to me because I go to church. The Blessed Mother sends us whatever we need without even discussing it with anybody. It's there when we need it. This little church has left a big mark to so many people. For those seeking guidance or a quiet place for reflection, for those seeking gentle reminders to the lessons their forefathers learned over a century ago. This little chapel holds the key. The Madonna Chapel is located on River Road, just outside of Plaquemine. The church is open every day to anyone who wishes to visit and enjoy its peace and solitude. And remember, the key is kept in the mailbox. From the smallest Louisiana church to arguably the largest, we next head north to Shreveport's Summer Grove Baptist Church. It was formed by a handful of people in 1849. Things have changed over the years. It is now a contemporary church of several thousand members, and it could be the right place for others shopping for a church home. Back in 2005, a large plot of land and a mountain of mortar and bricks in Shreveport moved from the material world into the spiritual. Welcome to Summer Grove Baptist Church, one of the largest churches in the state. The reason why it's so big, Summer Grove Baptist used to be a shopping mall. The former South Park Mall fell on hard times in the 90s. Crime was on the rise. Stores were closing. Fast forward a few years, Summer Grove church leaders, including Pastor Rod Masteller, were looking to expand. South Park Mall became a convert. Pastor Rob, what did this building used to be? This was a J.C. Penney's building. An anchor store. <laughs> yeah. Come on. I, tell you, I got to tell you a story. Come on. I, let's I, hear I, br I brought a Jewish rabbi in here. Uh -huh. We walked through this door, and, and he looked at him, and he said, wow. And then he said, Pastor, I used to buy my underwear right over there. <laughs> <laughs> The former J.C. Penney's is now a 2,500-seat sanctuary. Where a vacant shopping mall once stood, Mass Teller and others saw an opportunity to become the new anchor in the community. This area was really declining and was in very, very bad shape and turning the wrong direction. And we wanted to bring light here and hope here. And that's why we have that steeple out there is to say, you know, even if it if everything looks bad, you can turn it around, and that's what's happened here. I'm kind of a visionary, I'm kind of a, I kind of got a little bit of entrepreneur in me, and I just uh, thought, I wonder if this could be of God. Summer Grove now owns one million square feet of space. About one third of that is utilized. The unused areas of Dillard's and Montgomery Ward are closed off and look frozen in time. Getting a quick tour on foot would be challenging. That's where Associate Pastor Charles Reynolds steps in. Charles is walking the most effective way of transportation, getting around the mall church. I'd like to take a golf cart if we could. That'd make it a little bit quicker. Could we? Yes, let's I, do it. I like that idea a lot. <laughs> All right. <laughs> let's go. Pastor Reynolds says only two other malls in the country have been converted into a church on this scale. While it may seem a bit unorthodox, Reynolds believes there is a great deal of promise in turning old malls into new churches. And so as you look at this, we gave people opportunity to take actual old stores and we put Sunday school classes in them until we could have a chance to come in and actually gut them and remodel them. Charles points out a former storefront that is now the senior high school youth room. This shows you the type of work that our people have done transform this into a great area as far as our senior high is concerned and they can do a lot of different configurations in here from chairs to couches 
to tables and chairs, so this really provides a neat opportunity. The senior high youth room also offers ping pong and foosball. It even sports a stage for kids to play music and perform skits. Members give this space rave reviews. We have a 17-year-old daughter and a 14-year-old son, and when we lived in North Carolina, I couldn't get my daughter in church. She just didn't want anything to do with it, and here I can't get her out of church. <laughs> The activity area for preschoolers is located in the former El Chico restaurant and serves up a safari theme for the kids. And if you're looking for a good meal and fellowship, just head to the food court. Come on in and let me show you All right. what happened to Piccadilly. Hey, we're in a Piccadilly. We're in a Piccadilly. That's correct. <laughs> and let me show you how it's been transformed into an area for our church family to use for fellowships meals, etc. like this. Uh, we're going to stop here in the center area first. We can put about 240 people in this big area right here. Let me take you on in here and show you one of our private dining rooms so you can see how they turned out. Again, this doesn't look like a used Piccadilly when you look at how the church remodeled this. It really has a nice attractive air and uh, this room right here will hold approximately 75 people. Back near the sanctuary, music feeds the soul in the former Penny's Ladies and Mrs. Department. The choir meets every Wednesday night. We sing about 80 every Sunday morning and have an orchestra, a rhythm-driven orchestra with guitars, drums, and that's about 15 people. We lead worship every Sunday morning. Summer Grove has, had, has always had a rich history and a tradition of a choir, uh, not just as a performance group, but as a dynamic worship leading body. Continue the mall church tour and you will see a church clothing store. It is open Tuesdays and Thursdays. Anyone can come inside to shop. All the items inside the store are free. At the other end of the mall, the church also runs a counseling center. There are tenants here as well, including the Burlington Coat Factory. Living Interiors provides and cares for all the plants in the mall in exchange for store space. The Caddo Sheriff and Shreveport Police Departments opened a white collar crime unit. Inside, suspects are processed for crimes like forgery or check theft. And for anyone looking for a little forgiveness, that's just down the hall, first floor. One of the things that makes us trust is to know that somebody really loves me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. When we first moved here, when we lived in North Carolina, we were going to a very small, probably about 18 people all together, right? Mm -hmm. Church. And when we moved here, I wanted to find a very personable church. That's what I wanted. I wanted something small. But lo and behold, we came and this church has so much to offer. It's, I just couldn't believe it, that it was, that it is so personable. And it really doesn't matter to members what this building used to be. The resurrection of the mall is interesting, but it is far from the center of attention. And it's all in what you, what you use the space for and, you know, I mean, you, it's not a mall anymore. This is a church full of love. I mean, you don't even think of it as that anymore. And I, I really believe that this place is going to be used for many good things. There's lots of good things for the future. We believe very strongly that God didn't bring us out here without a great plan to help our community. The mall space at Summer Grove Baptist Church also houses medical records for a local hospital. The Cattle Parish School System holds adult education classes, and there's even a six cinema movie complex there. But that's not being used at this time. Stay right here. There's more places of worship to explore. When we come back, see how a New Orleans synagogue not only carries on Jewish traditions, but also has a vibrant foothold in Louisiana customs as well. You're watching Lost Louisiana, places of worship on Louisiana Public
Welcome back to Lost Louisiana Places of Worship. I'm your host, Charlie Winham. Next, we travel to a New Orleans synagogue that honors the memory of philanthropist and community leader Joseph Turo. The Turo Synagogue bears the same name of the oldest synagogue in America built in Newport, Rhode Island. And since 1828, the Jewish traditions have been carried out, but with the distinct style that is all New Orleans. The Turo Synagogue in New Orleans is as much a part of the city's fabric as the streetcars that pass by the St. Charles Street Sanctuary. And arguably, the person to give tours here is Adrian Gernsbacher Genet. Adrian is one of the most qualified and passionate for the job. When you include her five grandchildren, Adrian's family dates back seven generations to this congregation and to this city. I do tours as often as possible. I love to do them. I love to have people visit us because I think it's a beautiful building. And I also like to teach people uh, what the Jewish people are about. Adrian, how old is this synagogue? The building was yeah. built in 1909. However, parts of it go back to 1847. Really? Almost every congregation has an eternal light near Tamid. Uh, it reminds you that God is always present. Also, right above that, you'll see a copy, a replica of the Ten Commandments. Now remember in Hebrew, it's read right to left. So the first commandment is the upper right. The tenth is the lower left. Each synagogue also has an ark. It is symbolic of the Ark of the Covenant that carried the Ten Commandments. And our Torahs are housed in this ark, which was given by Judah Turo to the congregation on Canal Street. Beautiful. In 1847. So we use it for basically every service. And one or more Torahs are stored inside the ark. Each Torah is exactly the same. The first five books of the Bible. And there's a section read at each Sabbath service and other holidays also. Most Torahs have a breastplate, which is reminiscent of the breastplates that the priests in the temple in Jerusalem, the, the first temple, wore. Also, you'll see two crowns. Now the Torah is called the crown of the Jewish people and in a symbolic way we put crowns on these Torahs. This ark is over 160 years old and is made from the cedars of Lebanon. It offers a reminder of the merging of the German-based Gates of Mercy congregation and the second congregation dispersed of Judah made up of Portuguese descendants. The ark is also a reminder of the man who donated it, New Orleans philanthropist Judah Toro. In 1802, the year before the Louisiana Purchase, Judah came to New Orleans to make his fortune. Now at that time, New Orleans and the Louisiana Territory was under the control of the French and governed by something called the Code Noir, the Black Code. And one of the first lines in the Black Code is there shall be no Jews in the colony. But there were. There were Jewish people here. They didn't count, they weren't official, but they were allowed to come in for a certain length of time to do business and then leave. Turo became one of the richest men in the world. He was a cotton broker, shipping magnet, and real estate broker. One of his prime holdings was along Canal Street between Bourbon and Royal, called the Turo Block. He didn't seem to have that much feeling in his life, but in his death, he donated, designated money to every Jewish organization in the country, every congregation in the country, and a lot of international Jewish organizations that were existing at the time of his death. Over 150 years after Judah Turo's death, the current day Turo Synagogue is a vital and progressive center of Jewish life. You would think that a 185 year old congregation would be, you know, mostly mostly about its historical grandeur and its established ways, but this congregation is unusually forward-thinking, I, th I think, and unfettered by, um, unshackled by its history, but, you know, reverent about it and proud, but not dusty. 
I think the thing that that makes congregations so uh, vibrant here is the, the real priority of community. Churro Synagogue also has an undeniable foothold in New Orleans culture. Every year leading into Jazz Fest, Turo Synagogue hosts a Jazz Fest Shabbat. The Friday evening service has included New Orleans musical greats like Kermit Ruffin, Ellis Marsalis, Jeremy Davenport, and Marsha Ball. In a recently created tradition, performers are presented a jazzy jacket of many colors, created by congregation member Mia McGuire as a token of appreciation. And within the time of the service, there is a break from the regular ritual and worship for um, a 10 minute or so performance by our special guest. And it's just, it's as fun as it can be. It's just a hoot. Why is that so important? This is New Orleans, darling. You know, we gotta play the game and it works. Those are just some of the reasons Turo Synagogue is so special to Adrian. Katrina took her family's house in 2005, but no one will ever take away her worship home. This is my place. This is my place. This city is my city. I can't imagine not being here. Here meaning New Orleans, here meaning Turo Synagogue. And I hope I've imparted that to my children because both of my children live here and my five grandchildren are religious school students here. So I hope that this will become an eighth, a ninth, a tenth generation at Turo and in New Orleans. It's very important to me. I have a great sense of history here. Southern Jewish historian Eli Evans points out that over one million Jews live in the South. And many Jewish communities are thriving in Louisiana towns, including Natchitoches, Baton Rouge, Lafayette, Shreveport, and Monroe. Finally, our journey wraps up here in St. Francisville at the Grace Episcopal Church and Cemetery. The church was first organized in the spring of 1827. Some of the most challenging days occurred during the Civil War. Residents of that period suffered through the tough times with amazing amounts of grace. The treasures abound in and around Grace Episcopal Church in St. Francisville. Acorns planted in 1855 by Harriet Matthews from her old Greenwood plantation are now towering live oaks that reign over the sanctuary. St. Francisville resident Shirley Porcho has attended services here for over 20 years. Shirley? Yes? Why do you like this church so much? Well, I like it because of the people. They're so friendly and Christian and open to new ideas while maintaining the history. And Shirley loves to share the history of this church that was completed on Easter Sunday of 1860. Lighting this simple Gothic structure is a center chandelier donated in 1870 by James and Sarah Bowman of Rosedown Plantation. It was originally a gas light. And it is believed the last remaining pilcher organ in the United States rests here. Typical of English churches, the pews are divided. And at closer inspection, they are also numbered. Why are there numbers on the pews? Because originally you had to rent your pew. and uh, Rent your pew? Rent your pew. <laughs> <laughs> and we have some of the descendants of the people who uh, rented them and they still consider them their own personal property. And unfortunately, they might ask you to move if you sat in their pew. Now, not Nicely. Oh, yes. Just three years after Grace Church opened, these numbered pews also gave parishioners a front row seat to something never witnessed before. Grace Episcopal Church and the cemetery has stood witness to quite a remarkable story in Civil War history. It's a story that revolves around a Union commander of a vessel that was traveling up the Mississippi River and a Confederate soldier from St. Francisville. On this ground, inside this church, the Civil War stopped for one day. 
On June 11, 1863, the Union vessel USS Albatross was patrolling the Mississippi River near the port town of Bayou Serra. In the captain's stateroom, Lieutenant Commander John Elliott Hart fired a single bullet to his head. It is believed Hart took his own life after years of suffering from chronic stomach pain, known as dyspepsia. Commander Hart was dead at age 39. And before he died, he had requested to have to be buried, not in the river, which would be the traditional Navy practice, but on land. And he requested also that he have the full Masonic burial rites. Robert Leake is very familiar with the Civil War tale because it was his great-great-grandfather who approved Hart's funeral and burial on Confederate soil. W. W. Leake also happened to be a Mason and heard of Commander Hart's final wish of a burial with Masonic rites. He recognized uh, two obligations. First, as an officer of the armed forces of the Confederacy, it was his obligation to permit the enemy to bury the dead. And as a Mason, when he was informed that the decedent was a brother Mason, then his Masonic duty kicked in and he said, well, of course. And under a white flag of troops, Union soldiers brought Commander Hart's body from their vessel to Grace Episcopal Church. And that brotherhood, those bonds are strong enough that it even supersedes a civil war. Transcends the ha hatred and bitterness of the war. The Fraternity of Freemasons includes powerful bonds and dates back to the late 16th century. We attempt to instill into the initiate our principles of morality, virtue, honesty, charity, benevolence, brotherly love, support for your brother, and in the broader sense, dedication to service to the community and the country. Even though Captain Hart was born in New York, and even though Union forces shelled St. Francisville, Hart made his eternal home in Louisiana. After the war, um, some of Hart's descendants gave some thought to exhuming the body and reburying him in Schenectady. Mm -hmm. And when they came down and saw the grave, the surroundings, mm -hmm. and the way it was maintained by the local folk, they said, no, it's fitting that he remain here. And it is also fitting the gravesite of W.W. Leak rest between Grace Church and Commander Hart. Well, it, it imposes a certain burden on me to try to emulate him and to reach to conform to the standards that he set. It's a responsibility. One you take gladly? Yes, yes. And back inside, another story unfolds. I have a friend who won't sit anywhere but where she can see that red stained glass door. And the story is that one of the uh, Union officers on the gunboat who took part in the shelling had such a remorse for what they had done during the war to this beautiful little church and he sent them a hundred dollars and they put up that beautiful red stained glass door. Like any place of worship, stories of remorse, forgiveness, and mercy are common. Thoughts of Civil War bloodshed may be seen through the red bohemian glass. For others, it may offer rose-colored promises of hope and faith for mankind. It is even said that after the burial, Union troops invited W.W. Leake on board the USS Albatross to share a meal, but Leake declined. Union troops were also said to have left behind a skiff filled with medicine and supplies for the people of St. Francisville. Robert Leake was part of a documentary made in 2009 called The Day the War Stopped. And ever since 1999, Masonic brothers from both the North and the South gather every June in St. Francisville 
to reenact the burial of Lieutenant Commander John E. Hart. And that will bring an end to our journey for now. I hope you've enjoyed Lost Louisiana Places of Worship. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, thanks for watching.